And we are thrilled to have you and to have Reverend Hank Lay here and his expertise in this topic. Um, so I hope you have an enjoyable night. A few housekeeping things before we begin. Restrooms are um, right through the, the far door there, and there's a handicap restroom up this ramp. We will um, be hearing from Reverend Lay the first hour of our evening together, then we will break and have some refreshments. You can have a little bit of conversation, maybe about 15 minutes, and then we'll gather back here again and have an open time of discussion and questions that Reverend Lay will feel. You have also entered the Brookville Multi-Faith Campus, and we're thrilled to have four um, faith communities that are um, in existence here. We have the church that has been here since 1732. We have the Muslim Reform Movement organization and um, Dr. Abdul um, Hamid and his wife Sophia. Would you, would you sit so everyone can see you? And Reverend, or Rabbi, excuse me, Rabbi Stuart Paris and his wife, um, Reverend Kessler, who is an interfaith minister. <laughs> Rabbi is from um, the New Synagogue of Long Island, and this has been their one and only home, along with the Muslim group. And we have an, another group that is um, unique. They're not really a faith community. They kind of um, utilize our campus, and they're the interfaith community of Long Island. They are couples that are dual faith households, Jewish and Christian, and they've made a commitment to raise their children with an understanding and a respect and an education of both faith traditions. And something that we're really proud of about our campus is that they have a dual home here in that their synagogue and their church is at the same location. So the sanctuary is a church on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and the first Friday evening of every month it um, is a Shabbat service. And the Muslim group has their meetings twice a month in the room behind me, in the conference room, and they have a Quran study. So we're thrilled that you're here. I want to invite um, our Director of Multi-Faith Education, Leslie Mazada, to come up and she is going to open us in prayer. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, thank you for bringing us together for this very special multi-faith program. <clears throat> Even though we come from different faith traditions, backgrounds, and belief systems, we come here for a common purpose, to learn from one another, to get to know one another better, and to build authentic, loving relationships. Bless us as we go forth in this evening. Bless Reverend Hank Lay as he shares his presentation with us. And let us feel your gracious presence in all that we do tonight with one another. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I forgot to properly introduce Leslie. She is our uh, most recent staff member and a, a joint staff member for the Interfaith Community of Long Island in the church. And she is writing our unique children's curriculum and also organizing these events. Um, she is the catalyst behind us being together tonight. So Leslie, we're, we're glad you're part of our community. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Reverend Hank Lay. I know some of you know him very well because you're from his congregation. I'm glad you came out tonight. Um, I have known Reverend Lay for just under three years, and he had just come back from, actually I think you were in Palestine when, when I first came. You weren't even here. And um, got to hear some really exciting things about that trip and feel a real kindred, kindred spirit with um, Reverend Lay. So he is going to share from his academic wisdom and um, would love for especially the Muslim group and the Jewish community to take notes and tell him if he got his facts right. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, thank you for being here. <clears throat> Welcome. The handout that you 
be seen tells you where I want to go tonight. It also tells you very little about me. Um, and I don't think Googling is going to help me very much. <laughs> I've kept a very low profile in my career, so um, you're unlikely to find out too much <coughs> on me on the web. But I'll talk and share anything you want to ask afterwards. Needless to say, the, the topic I was asked to address tonight, the place of Jesus in Islam, in Judaism, and Christianity, is extremely broad. And I wish you to understand that what I'm presenting is simply a beginning place. Um, I've already spoken to one of my colleagues, and he notes very clearly that I'm only taking a particular narrow view of Jesus from Islam. I'm ignorant of the wider view, um, the other areas of Islam. I'm, if anything, I'm speaking for the view that makes the newspapers. The quieter view, I'm not aware of. And so, uh, clearly, we have opportunity at a further time to continue um, our learning together, perhaps more in a dialogue, where Sultan and I together can share like, over against and with what else is happening within Islam in particular. And needless to say, I have not tried to address Jesus in the wider popular culture, nor as he is seen by some of the uh, religions that are based in the Indian subcontinent, continent, some of which do include Jesus within their understanding of messages from God. So uh, with all of those caveats, uh, let me begin, uh, be aware that I was invited to use an hour and to do the topic justice, I am going to use it now. <laughs> um, if any of you have need to use the facilities during that hour, feel free to do so. Uh, on the other hand, if there's a wholesale rising up for cookies and refreshments, I'll realize that I've overstepped my well. The largest religion in today's world is Christianity accounting, loosely speaking, for about 31.5% of the world's inhabitants. Islam, the world's second largest religion, accounts for an additional 23%. And both religions are daughters of Judaism. Together, these three religions nurture and guide more than half the world's population. And of course, they wield an influence that affects 100% of the planet six plus billion living human beings. These numbers come from the Pew Research Center in 2012. Related to all three religions is the historical figure known as Jesus of Nazareth. <coughs> Jesus was raised as and lived as a Jew, a religion that goes back to Abraham in perhaps 2000 BCE. His followers found in him the presence of God in a unique way. And from that recognition was formed the religion we call Christianity. When Islam rose in the early 7th century of the Common Era, Allah, through Muhammad, peace be upon him, critiqued the Christian understanding of Jesus that had developed over the centuries, especially in the Arabian form, redefining the image of Jesus. The purpose of this paper is to give an introductory presentation of how Jesus is understood in these three religions. I will note commonalities and differences and explore whether the differences can be accommodated peacefully or only by trying to change each other. This is not simply an academic presentation. These three religions do not exist in segregated parts of the globe. Rather, they are increasingly intermixed and interacting. We can either let ignorance guide our interactions or develop mutual understanding. Christians in America have long interacted with Jewish neighbors, although anti-Semitism has often marred those interactions. But a Christian pastor recently stated, we now have a mosque in our community, and an increasing number of people who follow the Muslim faith are our neighbors. 
How do we approach and work with people of other faiths? His was and is not, I'm sorry, his was and is not an isolated question. A report by the Reformed Church in America states, whether demographically, sociologically, or theologically. Statistically, while more than three in four Americans identify themselves as Christians, the number of people in other faiths, or those claiming no faith at all, continues to climb annually. One of every 20 residents in the United States claims adherence to another faith, Jews and Muslims being the largest two groups. In Canada, the reality is even more pronounced. There, barely three in two persons claim, I'm sorry, barely two in three persons claim Christianity. And the number of persons practicing the Muslim faith is three times that of the United States. In short, it is becoming more and more likely that persons who adhere to a faith group other than Christianity are living in your city or town and are establishing their own religiously based organizations. End of quote from that report. This is certainly true here on Long Island. And this gathering place in Brookville is a testimony to that truth. Adding to the confusion and emotions are the frequent terrorist attacks committed in the name of or against the name of all three religions. The recent Israeli elections also involve religious polarization. We have gathered here tonight to increase our understanding of one another and seek common cause in the struggle for community and worldwide brotherhood. My focus is limited, but my context is broad. I trust that this will be a, a fruitful evening together. I wish to begin with a presentation of Jesus as portrayed in the Quran and believed by normative Muslims. Islam honors Jesus in Arabic Isa, peace be upon him, as a great prophet and messenger from God second in importance only to Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a revealer of God's will. Jesus was sent by God to the Jews to call them back to God and purify their religion. Thus the Quran would see him as a prophet such as Hosea, Isaiah, and Jeremiah in the Hebrew Bible, although greater and second only to Muhammad. <clears throat> Quoting from the Quran, these are the signs of Allah. We rehearse them to thee, Muhammad, in truth. Verily, thou art one of the messengers. Those messengers we endowed with gifts, some above others. To one of them Allah spoke. Others he raised to degrees of honor. To Jesus, the son of Mary, we gave clear signs and strengthened him with the Holy Spirit. End quote. The Quran speaks about Jesus in many places. In doing so, it speaks primarily about him and reports few, if any, of the stories and sayings that are familiar in the Christian Gospels. Many of the stories are connected with his mother, Mary, in Arabic, Miriam. There is a surah in the Quran named after Mary, the only surah named after a woman. And another surah is named after her father's house, the house of Imran. Most of the references to Jesus are found in these two surahs. In the words of a Christian scholar, the Christ story is not retold in the Quran, only referred to. Furthermore, many of the references to Christ are found within a context where Mary is the dominant figure. End quote. Peter Ford, a personal friend and Christian scholar who teaches about Islam, notes four major claims made about Jesus in the Quran. First, Jesus was born in a miraculous manner, to Mary as a virgin, without a human father. The story is told of Mary's upbringing, the visit to her by an angel in the form of a human messenger, 
the power of God to bring forth a child in her by divine command and the birth of Jesus. While details differ, the stories in the New Testament and the Quran are remarkably similar. <clears throat> Thus we read in Surah Maryam, then we, and God in the Quran uses the divine we, then we sent into her our spirit, and it assumed for her the likeness of a perfect man. She said, Lo, I seek refuge in the Beneficent One from thee, if thou art God-fearing. He said, I am only a messenger from thy Lord, that I may bestow on thee a faultless son. She said, How can I have a son, when no mortal hath touched me, neither have I been unchaste? He said, So it will be. Thy Lord saith, it is easy for me, and it will be, that we may make of him a revelation for mankind, and a mercy from us, and it is a thing ordained." Unquote. Second, Jesus was a prophet sent by God in company with other prophets who preceded him. He is linked with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and others. He was sent with a message consistent with that of previous Hebrew prophets. Thus Muhammad is told to declare to believers, Say, O Muhammad, we believe in Allah, and that which is revealed unto us, and that which was revealed unto Abraham, and Ishmael, and Isaac, and Jacob, and the tribes, and that which was vouchsafed unto Moses, and Jesus, and the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and unto Allah we have surrendered." End quote. Third, Jesus was given extraordinary titles that were unique to him as a special prophet of God. Two terms in particular are important for both the Quran and the New Testament. The, the title Kalima, Arabic for a word, and al Messiah, the Messiah, or Christ, found 11 times in the Quran. Concerning Kalia, Kalima, Christians may think of the Gospel of John, which begins, in the beginning was the Word. And fourth, Jesus performed miracles by means of God's power. <coughs> As in the Gospels, the Quran claims that Jesus, through the power and permission of God, healed the blind and the lepers, and raised the dead to life. Allah says to Jesus in the Quran, O Jesus, son of Mary, remember my favor unto thee and unto thy mother, how I strengthened thee with the Holy Spirit, so that thou spoke unto mankind in the cradle and in maturity, and how I taught thee the scriptures and wisdom and the Torah and the gospel and how thou did shape of clay, as it were the likeness of a bird by my permission, and did blow upon it, and it was a bird by my permission. And thou did heal him who was born blind, and the leper by my permission. And how thou did raise the dead by my permission. And how I restrained the children of Israel from harming thee, when thou came unto them with clear proofs. End quote. The Quran is clear that Jesus was a powerful witness to the oneness and power of Allah. As the predecessor of Muhammad, Jesus did not point to himself, but to the one who sent him. Quote, I spake unto them only that which thou commandest me, saying, Worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. I was witness of them while I dwelt among them. And when thou took me, thou watched the watcher over them. Thou art witness over all things. For both Muslims and Christians, Jesus will be part of the day of judgment. In particular, Jesus will testify to himself and his ministry over against those who rejected him in his ministry and those who have made him more than he was. I'll say more about that later. 
Muslims read the Quran, read in the Quran that Jesus prophesied the coming of Muhammad. Quote, Remember that Jesus, the son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am the messenger of Allah, sent to you confirming the law which came before me, and giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmad. But when he came to them with clear signs, they said, This is evident sorcery. The standard Muslim understanding is that Ahmad is a reference to Muhammad, who came with clear signs and was accused of sorcery. Of course, any similar words in the Christian Gospels are given another meaning. For Muslims and Christians willing to find comparable beliefs in each other's faith traditions, these points of commonality about the person and mission of Jesus have provided areas for mutual exploration and dialogue. However, it must be noted that the virgin birth speaks for Muslims of God's power and not of the identity of Jesus. And giving Jesus the titles of Word and Messiah has none of the associations made by Christians. Any attempt to use these as starting points for dialogue will fail because these Christian understandings are not part of Islam. If you're following my outline, I'm now where Jesus as viewed by Judaism. <coughs> Jesus is viewed by Jews as a teacher whose views about how to love God and love one's neighbor were in harmony with what became rabbinic Judaism in the Christian era. The New Testament Gospels indicate that Jesus lived a fully Jew Jewish life and debated with other Jews about how to best live a life guided by the Torah. And the writers of both Matthew and Luke have Jesus insist on the continuing importance and centrality of the Jewish law. Many of his teachings in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere reflect larger debates within the Jewish community about how the law should be understood and lived out. While some of those debates were heated, particularly with some of the teachers associated with the Pharisees, Luke's Gospel tells us that when Herod Antipas sought to kill Jesus, it was a group of Pharisees who warned him. So much of the teaching of Jesus mirrors the Jewish Bible, which indeed was his own. Matthew and Mark report that while in Jerusalem during Christian Holy Week, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is a most Jewish answer to a most Jewish question. The Pharisees commonly debated among themselves regarding the Torah and the important sections of it. Jesus' reply is in two parts, both from the Torah. The first is the Shema, the Jewish creed found in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Every Jew knew these verses. And over time they have become the confession of faith for all Jews. To this Jesus adds the words from Leviticus, which read in their entirety, Do not hate your brother in your heart. <clears throat> Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so that you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Keep 
my decrees. A collection of sayings found in the Gospel of Matthew is called the Beatitudes or Blessings. They clearly echo phrases and values from the Hebrew Scriptures. A few examples should suffice. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, said Jesus. The prophet Isaiah declared, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to be a herald of joy to the poor. And again Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord, This is the man to whom I will look, he that is humble and poor and contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. Throughout the book of Psalms, God is the defender and sustainer of the poor. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted, said Jesus. Isaiah said, The Lord anointed me to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to provide and bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. With his blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth, Jesus virtually quotes Psalm 33, the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. Jesus' golden rule is found in Matthew chapter 7. Do for others what you would like them to do for you. This is a summary of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Such a teaching was not unique to Jesus. In his time, a leading school of Jewish teaching followed Rabbi Hillel. Hillel's famous statement is, What is hateful for you, do not do to your neighbor." This is the whole Torah. Hillel and Shammai were two leading sages of the late 1st century BCE and early 1st century CE who founded opposing schools of Jewish thought known as the House of Hillel and the House of Shammai. The debate between these schools on matters of ritual practice, ethics, and theology was critical for shaping the oral law and Judaism as it is today. In general, the House of Shammai's positions were stricter than those of the House of Hillel. A study of the debates between Jesus and other Jewish leaders, often called Pharisees, places Jesus closer to the House of Hillel in his interpretation of Torah and his teachings regarding relations with the occupying Romans. The importance of Torah and its commands to love God and one's neighbor is affirmed by both Jesus and the Pharisees. While they did disagree on some interpretations of the Torah, Jesus is reported to have taught, quote, do not think that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the Torah until everything is accomplished." End quote. Despite Jesus' connection with the Jewish scriptures and his place within the tradition of Jewish teachers, contemporary Jews have at least two reasons to pay little attention to Jesus and his teachings. First, Jesus was not unique. He was a mainline Jew. Since his followers later split violently with the synagogue, there was no reason to pay attention to his teachings. And second, as Christianity developed, it made Jesus its God, and in his name persecuted the Jews. Nevertheless, Professor Michael Cook teaches a New Testament course at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. In his course, he hopes for future Jewish rabbis to understand the internal issues of the New Testament that led to its notably anti-Jewish tenor. In the process, Jesus himself comes across as less anti-Jewish 
and more a Jew in tension with parts of his tradition and practice. Thus we can see that Jesus is clearly a Jewish teacher who sought to call his people back to faithfulness with their God. His popularity with the masses was a political, not a religious threat. The issue was Jewish leadership and compliance with the Roman rule. Jesus threatened the balance between Rome and the Jewish elites, a kingdom of God. The core of Jesus' teachings was a threat, no matter what Jesus thought his message was. He died because his actions and teachings created excitement and drew large crowds and thus was perceived as a threat to those in power, both the client rulers who represented Rome and the Jewish elites who stood to benefit. Jesus in Christianity. Perhaps the best starting point to express the beliefs of Christianity regarding Jesus is the creeds, the apostolic and Nicene. These statements of faith developed within Christianity in the 3rd and 4th centuries of the Common Era to declare what was believed to be true and acceptable and what was judged heretical and to be rejected. The creeds were approved by councils with representatives from many areas of the then known Christian Church. And in your handout are the words I will now read from the creeds. The Apostles' Creed reads thus, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. The Nicene Creed reads thus, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. A brief note. Both creeds continue on to state a Christian understanding of the Holy Spirit. I am not choosing to discuss the Spirit this evening. Regarding Jesus, according to the creeds, there are two distinctive beliefs of Christianity. First, the relationship of Jesus to God the Creator. And second, the role of Jesus in God's plan for the salvation of the world. The creeds define the relationship of God the Creator and Jesus Christ with the metaphor, Father and Son. Most clearly, this is not a physical relationship. Mary is not God's spouse in the, in the beginning of Jesus. As we read in the Quran, so also in the New Testament, Mary states that she cannot be pregnant since she has had no relations with a man. The Gospel of Matthew simply states, Mary was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of Luke, the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God, for nothing is impossible with God. 
the Holy Spirit is God's instrument to enable the fulfillment of God's command. The title, Son of God, used in the Gospel of Luke, has a long history in the Hebrew Bible. In Psalm 2, it is applied to the Davidic king who rules with God's authority and power. This is rooted in the divine oracle through the prophet Nathan to King David. There God declares of David's heir, quote, I will be his father and he will be my son, unquote. This is the context of God's promised protection. I'm sorry, this is in the context of God's promised protection and the establishment by God of David's royal lineage forever. The messianic words in Isaiah chapter 9 and 11 speak of a royal son, an heir, endowed with divine characteristics. Christianity has taken these Hebrew oracles and applied them to Jesus. Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah who embodied divine traits. Son or sons of God could also refer to the people of Israel, the Hebrews, whom God freed from slavery in Egypt. In the book of Exodus we read, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go free that he may worship me. Unquote. Here we see the metaphor used for a relationship between God and worshiper. God who acts to claim his child from the slaveholder, Pharaoh. Based on this relationship, many prophets spoke of God punishing the Israelites as a father punishes his son. Jesus, in his self-awareness, addressed God as his father and taught his followers to call God our Father, who is in heaven. Once again, the term is clearly used to denote closeness and care, not physical relationship. As this relates to Jesus, over time, Christian theology used this term in its development of the doctrine of the Trinity. Believers sought to understand the relationship of Jesus who embodied for them divine traits, to his heavenly Father, the creator of heaven and earth. In doing so, the church located Jesus within the Godhead in such a way as to leave itself open to associate accusations of tritheism. The oneness of God, so central to Hebrew thought and Jewish theology, appears to have been confused by a Christian's attempt to understand Jesus and the Divine Spirit present in Him and in believers. And yet, the Nicene Creed is clear. We believe in one God. The second distinctive Christian understanding of Jesus relates to His role in God's plan for the salvation of humankind. In speaking of this, I will use only broad statements. Because Christian theology in this matter is diverse and complex. We in the Reformed tradition and my friends in the Methodist tradition have very different ways of articulating this. The New Testament uses the verb to save and the noun savior to describe the work and role of Jesus in God's plan. The Gospel of John in the third chapter is a classic statement. Quote, God loved the world so much that God sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish eternally, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. Unquote. Suffice it here to say that Christians believe that God won sent Jesus into the world, and second, for the purpose of saving humanity from its sin condition. The divine plan included the death of Jesus by Roman crucifixion, and the vindication of Jesus and God's honor by raising Jesus from the dead. This clearly ascribes to Jesus the highest honor from God, 
which for many Christians reveal Jesus' own divinity. I make note that I make note of the fact that on Sunday, Western Christians begin the annual eight-day celebration of this understanding of Jesus. And thus the Apostle Paul wrote. Being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Christians boldly declare that there is only one God, creator of heaven and earth. But having experienced and continue to experience the divine in Jesus, they have sought to explain it by speaking of diversity within the one Godhead. The Godhead is not static, but dynamic. There is mutual interaction within the Godhead. And Jesus is part of the Godhead. Not by addition, a human became divine and was added to the pantheon. But from all time, Jesus was sent to earth from the Godhead in order to fulfill the twofold mission of calling believers back to faithfulness to the true God and to accomplish the divine action that would save the world from its sin." Unquote. Thus Jesus the prophet and Jewish teacher was more than those titles. Jesus was God, present with humanity in the form of a man. Christians believe that Jesus demonstrated signs and proofs of this reality sufficient that all should accept it as true. Shake it out a minute. <laughs> Shuffle in your, in your seats. <coughs> so let me make some direct comparisons. If we start our comparisons by using the two ecumenical Christian creeds, we find agreement among all three religions on the first article of the creeds. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. The unity of God, the Creator, is the linchpin of all three religions. This defines monotheism especially Judaism and Islam, grew out of polytheistic societies and called people to affirm one God. Christianity also affirms this. All three religions locate Jesus in an agreed-upon historical context. He was a Palestinian Jewish man living in the Roman provinces of Galilee and Judea in the first century of the Common Era. Jesus was a religious teacher within a normative Jewish tradition of the time. His views were in agreement with many other Jewish teachers. He called upon Jews to come back to their God in faithfulness and commitment to the ancient teachings found in Torah. His gospel was not a new word, but repeated an ancient word going back to Adam and Noah. Islam and Christianity agree that Jesus' conception as a human was unique, occurring by the command and power of God. Jesus had no human father. His mother Mary was a virgin. They agree that Jesus was able, with God's permission and power, to perform signs that confirmed his message and identity as a special messenger from God. They agree that God took Jesus to heaven alive and that Jesus will return to participate in the day of judgment. But as we shall now see, these agreements are not sufficient to prevent each religion 
from rejecting and often condemning the understandings of the other two. While tonight we are mostly polite and patient with one another, throughout history our differences have often led to violence. Militarily, Islam and Christianity have often been of even strength and major wars were fought. Jews have always been a minority. Often powerless and terrible atrocities have been committed against them by both Christians and Muslims. We are still struggling to overcome the priorities of our religions and find a commonality in our humanity, itself a gift from God the Creator. So let me talk more specifically about those differences that lead to such hostility. In my summation of Christianity, I spoke of the relationship of Jesus to God the Creator as the heart of the religion. Jesus is divine, related to God the Creator using a metaphor of father-son. While Islam highly reveres Jesus as a prophet second to Muhammad, peace be upon him. It cannot accept Jesus as related in essence to God using any metaphor. The Quran is clear. There is no God but He. That is the witness of Allah, His angels, and those endued with knowledge, standing firm on justice. There is no God but He, the one exalted in power, the wise. The Quran quotes Jesus when it says, Such was the testimony, Jesus the son of Mary. It is a statement of truth about which they vainly dispute. Jesus says, It is not befitting to the majesty of Allah that he should beget a son. Glory be to him. When he determines a matter, he only says, Be, and it is. Verily, Allah is my Lord and your Lord. Him therefore serve. This is the way that is straight. End of the quote from Jesus and the Quran continues. But the sects differ among themselves. And woe to the unbelievers because of the coming judgment of a monstrous day. Again, and behold, on the day of judgment, Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, didst thou say unto men, Worship me and my mother as gods in derogation to Allah? Jesus will say, Glory to thee. Never could I say what I had no right to say. Had I said such a thing, thou would indeed have known it. Thou knowest what is in my heart, though I know not what is in thine. For thou knowest in full all that is hidden. Never said I to them aught except what thou did command me to say, to wit, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. And I was witness over them while I dwelt among them. When thou didst take me up, thou wast the watcher over them, and thou art a witness to all things. If thou dost punish them, they are thy servants. If thou dost forgive them, Thou art the one exalted in power, the wise. To associate anything with God is the worst expression of unbelief. In Arabic, shirk. In Christian language, mortal sin. Islam arose among extensive polytheism. The call to submit and worship one God was the heart of Islam. Jews and Christians were people of the book who had received true revelation concerning monotheism from a long line of prophets and messengers. To the extent that Jews and Christians deviated from this core belief, they were no better than pagans. It appears that in Christianity among the Arab tribes in the 6th century CE, God, Jesus, and Mary were linked in worship. The title Trinity may have referred to this grouping. To Muhammad and the Muslims, this was polytheism. 
God, through Muhammad, spoke strongly against it, condemning to eternal fire any who would not repent and return to true religion, to Islam. Quoting the Quran, they do blaspheme who say, Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. But said Christ, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Whoever joins other gods with Allah, Allah will forbid him the garden, and the fire will be his abode. There will be for the wrongdoers no one to help. They disbelieve who say, Allah is one of three in a trinity, for there is no God except one God. If they desist not from their word of blasphemy, verily a grievous penalty will befall them. Why turn they not to Allah and seek his forgiveness? For Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. Christ the Son of Mary was no more than a messenger. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. His mother was a woman of truth. They had both to eat their daily food. See how Allah doth make his signs clear to them. Yet see in what ways they, meaning Christians, are deluded away from the truth. God speaks very clearly in the Quran. Jesus was not divine, nor God's Son. Trinity is a false belief. Allah alone handles all things in heaven and on earth. Christ himself worships Allah. Christ cannot protect us on the day of judgment. Since this is bedrock belief for Muslims, it certainly sets limits to our interactions. The oneness of God has been a part of theological thought among Muslims from the beginning of their faith. There is extensive theological writing on the topic. Likewise, over the centuries, Muslim and Christian theologians have discussed the subject. Recently, Miroslav Volf, a professor at Yale University, wrote the book, Allah, A Christian Response, in an attempt to identify Allah with the Christian God. The book is on the table here. While highly recognized, Wolf has not solved the problem as to whether or not the Muslim and Christian gods are one and the same God. The truth or falsehood of each other's God remains the grounds for violence and slaughter. Kill the infidels, spoken on both sides. In addition to the doctrine of God, Christians and Muslims disagree with any doctrine of salvation. The Christian understanding involves salvation from sin, with Jesus being God's instrument to accomplish this. But Muslims do not believe in original sin that blackens every person, and so salvation is not a needed solution. I wish to read from a book by Stephen Prothero, a professor, and that book is on the table also. Every human being is born with an inclination both to, toward God and toward the good. Sin is not a problem that Islam addresses. Neither is there any need for salvation from sin. In Islam, the problem is self-sufficiency. The hubris of acting as if you can get along without God, who alone is self-sufficient. The idol of yourself writes the Sufi mystic Rumi, is the mother of all idols. Replace this idol with submission to Allah, and what you have is the goal of Islam, a soul at peace in this life and in the next paradise. The Quran repeatedly states that the path to paradise is paved with both faith and works. Those who believe and do righteous deeds, for them awaits a great triumph. But Islam inclines more toward Judaism and away from Christianity by emphasizing orthopraxy, right action, 
over orthodoxy, right doctrine. Here, the technique that will take you from self-sufficiency to paradise is to perform the religion, to be a Muslim. Clearly, Islam does not need a savior, a key doctrine in Christianity. Muhammad is not a savior. So on this matter, we have different views. In these two key areas of belief, Islam and Christianity disagree. Whether we can honor and respect one another while agreeing to disagree on these key matters remains to be seen. I concluded above that Jesus was a mainline Jewish teacher. I wish to modify that judgment with an awareness that in the Gospel books, Jesus is presented as over against his tradition in some crucial respects. Scholarly opinion is divided as to how much of this over againstness was part of Jesus' own self-consciousness and how much was attributed to him by the Gospel writers. One basic issue was the role of the Torah and the authority of Jesus. There is a classic collections of teachings in the Gospel of Matthew that follows the pattern, you have been taught, but I say to you. The topics under discussion come from the Torah. To the extent that Jesus is giving an interpretation of the Torah, he is a mainline teacher. To the extent that he seeks to replace the Torah with his own teaching, he is beyond that which is acceptable. Zev Garber, a Jewish rabbi, wrote, As Rabbi Jesus, he taught the divine authority of the Torah and the prophets and respect for its presenters and preservers. But the Gospels claimed that his authority was equally divine, and that it stood above the authority of the Torah. End quote. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew judged that Jesus taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. From this, it was a short step to say that Jesus replaces the Torah. The Gospels present Jesus as the Messiah promised by God through the Hebrew prophets. But the Jewish position is that Jesus did not meet the conditions which the prophetic rabbinic tradition associated with the coming of the Messiah. Further, again to quote Garber, no matter how composite the figure of the historical Jesus and how rudimentary the concept of the Christ event in the Second Testament, there can be no doubt that the Jewish and Gentiles believers bestowed divine attributes and power upon Jesus and venerated him above all creatures. Such an attitude toward the person of Jesus as God incarnate led to conflict with the sages who revered only Torah from heaven. End quote. Also, the God-man of the hypostatic union, that's a Christian doctrine that relates Jesus to God, is foreign to the Torah, which is speaking of absolute monotheism. Since all forms of Christianity see Jesus as more than a teacher sent by God, as in some way partaking of the divine, the split with Judaism is clear and basic. In this judgment, Judaism agrees with Islam. Nevertheless, Professor Michael Cook and many other Jewish and Christian scholars seek to separate Jesus the teacher from Jesus the Christ within the Christian teachings, from the red letter editions of the New Testament that attribute almost everything in the Gospels to Jesus himself, to the work of the Jewish <coughs> seminar, of the Jesus seminar, the spectrum of scholarship has dissected the New Testament. A commonly accepted conclusion is that the New Testament reflects the conflict between all Jews and Rome and between Jews who accepted Jesus as the Messiah and those who did not. These conflicts were written 
into the Gospels in particular. Zev Garber uses an example, the Gospel of John, in which during the, one of the conflicts between Jesus and the Pharisees, Jesus is heard to say, you are children of the devil, and you reject God's truth. Extremely harsh language. But not unexpected when we listen to the rhetoric, both from the synagogue and the church, as the two were separating from one another in the late first century and into the second century. The, the, the conclusion of Garber and many other scholars is that the rhetoric of the conflict was read back into the Gospels and put on the mouth of Jesus. Professor Michael Cook, mentioned before, believes that by studying the Christian scriptures, Jews might understand the historical development of these scriptures and be led to an appreciation of Jesus as a Jewish teacher. But, in my opinion, Jews are not living with Jesus. They are living with Christians. And the onus falls upon Christians to correct their own understanding and seek ways to repair the damage they have done to Jews. Popes John Paul II and Francis I recognize this. Islam sees Jesus as a prophet and messenger sent by Allah to call the Jews back to their ancestral faith. He was given the gospel. At times it seems that the Quran is speaking out about a book that was given to Jesus, which agreed with and confirmed the message of the Torah and the prophets. By signs and miracles performed with Allah's permission, and given, Jesus gave a reliable witness to Allah. The Jews, however, rejected Jesus, and God rescued him from their schemes to kill him. On the day of judgment, Jesus will be present to affirm his witness and condemn those who rejected him. Jesus also prophesied the coming of a great prophet who is understood to be Muhammad. Christianity agrees that Jesus was sent by God with a message of repent addressed to the Jews of his day. It agrees that Jesus did not bring a new religion but a reaffirmation of Moses and the prophets. By God's Spirit received at his baptism, Jesus was able to perform miracles. Yes, Jesus was rejected by Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, but God allowed Jesus to be crucified and vindicated him through resurrection from death. In the matter of the crucifixion and resurrection, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam differ. Judaism has no reason to question the historicity of the crucifixion. Such was a common fate for Jews who dared proclaim a kingdom in opposition to Rome. Jews would also affirm that Jewish elites aligned with Roman power would have found Jesus a threat to their status and thus would have supported Pilate's decision to kill Jesus. But it is a theological jump to blame all Jews for the death of Jesus. Jesus himself was Jewish, as was his followers. And of course, on the other hand, Jews have no reason to accept the resurrection story. But the Quran questions the death of Jesus by crucifixion. It does not do so by directly opposing Christian belief, but by blaming the Jews for rejecting Jesus and attempting to kill him. They only thought they succeeded. To quote a very famous passage out of the Quran, they, the Jews, rejected faith in that they uttered against Mary a false, grave charge. That they said in boast, we kill Christ, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts, with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. 
for of a surety they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself, and Allah is exalted in power, wise. And there is none of the people of the book, but must believe in him before his death. And on the day of judgment, he, Jesus, will be a witness against them. This verse has been subject to diverse interpretations, even among Muslims. Some have said that someone who looked like Jesus was crucified. Others that Allah snatched Jesus from the cross. What is clear is that the gospel accounts, so central to Christianity, are denied by implication. The passion stories in the Gospels, so central to Christian worship this coming week, find no support in the Quran. As is clear by its iconography, the cross is the central event for Christians. Jesus is reported to have taught that it was part of the divine plan for his life. Quote, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man, Jesus' preferred name for himself, will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day he will be raised to life. Unquote. Again, Jesus said, quote, The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed by God. Unquote. In the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. The Gospel stories are clear that Jesus was mistreated by the Roman soldiers, nailed to a cross, and he died there. His followers, with Roman permission, took his body down from the cross and buried it in a grave. Now, the Apostle Paul recognized the theological difficulty when he wrote, quote, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. I resolved to know nothing when I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden, and that God destined for our glory before time began. And again elsewhere Paul wrote, being found in the appearance of a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Unquote. The exaltation of which Paul wrote is the resurrection of Jesus from the tomb to heaven. His dead body came alive again by the power and intention of God. This was a total surprise to his followers. Although he had taught them to expect it, it was beyond their realm of possibility. So the Gospels contain at least five stories telling of his appearances alive to his followers. The resurrection is the vindication of Jesus by the power of God. It is the central doctrine of the Christian faith. Again, quoting Paul, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are found then to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that God raised Christ from the dead. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection from the dead comes also through a man. 
For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For Christ must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. End quote. The power and purpose of God is seen not in preventing death, but in overcoming the power of death through resurrection. This is the meaning of the Christian holiday of Easter, to be celebrated shortly. Christianity also sees Jesus as the Christ, the person through whom God brings salvation to the world. The Gospel writers built on the Jewish concept of the Messiah, a descendant of King David. Thus Luke writes in his Gospel, quote, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end, unquote. Matthew uses a similar concept when he writes, You shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus is based on the Hebrew verb to save. Following the Jewish concept of sin on a human, excuse me, following the Jewish concern for the impact of sin on a human being and human society, Jesus is seen as God's final answer to save humanity from sin. Returning briefly to the Apostle Paul, he finds all humanity condemned by the reality of sin. All men, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin, he wrote. But he sees the power of God at work in Jesus Christ. All are set right by God's grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood to be received by faith, unquote. Such an understanding of God is totally different from Islam. And Paul's use of Jewish concepts is different from normative Jewish theology. In Jesus, God has done something unique and definitive for the future of humankind. This is the Christian gospel. I'm down to the last section. <laughs> Five more minutes. It should be clear that our three religions, in their final judgments, do not see Jesus with the same meaning. Our histories have found in our differences grounds for strong condemnations and violent actions. By the ethical norms of all three religions, this has been regrettable. We cannot applaud the wholesale disdain and destruction of those judged to be unbelievers and our enemies, no matter how convinced we are that we are acting in the true name of God. We all stand under God's greater judgment. It should also be clear that I, as the presenter, in no way stand in a position of judgment. I cannot tell believers of another religion what they should do regarding another religion, nor, in terms of tonight's presentation, what they should believe about Jesus, historical or otherwise. My own tradition of Christianity speaks to me with these words of Jesus, judge not, lest you be judged by God. So let me rather ask some rhetorical questions addressed to myself first, to my Christian understanding of Jesus, which might be heard by others. Can I see in Jesus a word from God that does not exclude others? Can the development of Christianity, even within my own scriptures, be brought under the judgment of Jesus? Does my understanding of Jesus allow a vision of the breadth of God and allow God's activities in the world 
that includes rather than excludes others? Does my view of Jesus open the future to new divine possibilities? Or does it close or limit the future? Does my view of Jesus help to envision a better future than the past? I don't have answers, but I have questions. And I do wish to be bold and make a few pointed suggestions. The Quran speaks repeatedly that Jesus came with such signs that proved that he was from God. In an article in a Christian theological dictionary, the writer says, quote, all signs are pointers to Yahweh himself, a revelation of his might and glory. Yahweh is the anglicized form of the name of the Jewish God, perhaps the equivalent to Allah. I'm sure Muslims would agree with what I'm reading relating to Allah as well. In the signs, Israel, indeed all nations of the world, are to encounter Yahweh and to recognize that He alone is God. Since the ultimate goal of signs is the universal glorification of the divine name, unbelief and disobedience in the face of the demonstrative experience of signs are regarded as the expression, the expression of an utterly incomprehensible hardness of heart." Unquote. Applying this view to Jesus, scholarship by all three faiths seeks to discover the historical Jesus in back of the texts. Might Islam view this Jesus, the historical Jesus, as a sign such that Christians are challenged to discover the meaning of this sign for themselves. Is it necessary for Islam to condemn the further developments of Christian doctrine to the point of execution? The Quran sees Jesus present at the Day of Judgment as witness to his true self. In that context, the Quran records Jesus as saying, if thou dost punish them, they are thy servants. You are free to do so. They are your servants. If thou dost forgive them, thou art the one exalted in power, the wise. Might Islam today leave that judgment to the day of judgment and not presume to condemn and execute Christians in the present? Of course, the same must be said of my Christianity. As I quoted a minute ago, Jesus taught, judge not lest you be judged by God. The history of Christianity is filled with judgments and executions. Such views are rooted in our scriptures. Regarding the rejection of Jesus by some Jewish leaders of his day, a story called a parable of Jesus, attributed to Jesus, states, quote, God will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others, unquote. Some forms of Christian theology have used this text from the Hebrew prophet Isaiah to condemn all Jews and replace them with Christians as the bearers of God's witness in the world. Too many other Christian scriptures have been used this way. So again I ask, might Christianity today leave such judgment to the day of judgment and not presume to condemn and execute non-Christians in the present? As Christians and Muslims, we cannot speak simply of the historical Jesus divorced from his meaning as a figure of faith. What we believe about him is as important as what we say he was like in his time and place. But we can be challenged by him to view others in the best possible light, deferring our judgments to those of God, Allah, in the day of judgment. Both our scriptures elevate mercy to be one of the greatest virtues. To Jews, I would simply ask, is it possible to view Jesus the Jew apart from Christianity? 
perhaps the history of Christianity continues to make that impossible. Here tonight we have representatives of various faith traditions. In this setting we are peaceful and polite. You have put up with me well. <laughs> At our best we seek to create such a setting for all humanity. We desire for God's truth to permeate all civilizations, to touch hearts and minds with divine purpose and attitudes. At our worst, we believe our separate understandings are complete and sufficient, sufficient to judge others as heretics and worthy of divine judgment. At our best, we humbly bow before the divine and acknowledge our limitations. Our three traditions will continue to live together and interact on planet Earth. We are neighbors seeking the best future for us all. I would hope that my presentation gives us a greater understanding of one another and thereby allows us to view one another with mercy and respect. Thank you for your time this evening. about a 10 minute break. Um, please avail yourself to our refreshments that we have and then we'll gather back and if you have any questions or feedback or comments, um, we're going to do that the last um, 30 minutes of our time together. So thanks so much for <laughs>
And, and I will tell you, in answer to your first rhetorical question, we as Jews can see Jesus as a wonderful rabbi in the tradition of the Torah, a reformer, one who felt that we went astray and sought to bring us back. Uh, and